All right. So verbal and nonverbal communication. Now, how do we define them? Um, well, first, again, when we define verbal and nonverbal, it's a lot of things. So again, it's not just the spoken language. So we see here. So um, we don't only refer to the spoken and the written language. So anything that I speak, I'm speaking right now, but also to the body language. So for example, I come from a, remember, I come from a high context culture and we use a lot of elements. So we use your hand, use your body, use your voice tone, and all of these send different messages. Verbal communication is again something that you um, written, something that is spoken. And again, in general, verbal is what using your words. So emails is verbal language. Uh, anything that you guys write on your, C4 discussion is verbal language and so on. Um, Nonverbal language here refers to other means. So such as again, body language, gestures, and of course, silence. Um, silence like what? Like, like let's say um, one of my students did uh, something, um, did not re do really well at all in their midterm. So I'm, I'm talking to them, I'm giving them, you know, a small lecture, like you should have prepared or studied or come talk to me. So this student is maybe silent, uh, maybe they're not looking to me in their eye and then maybe they have their head down a little bit and they're quiet throughout the whole um, conversation. What do you think this, um, this message is sending me? What do you think the sender is trying to tell me? When they are quiet, they're not looking at me, and they're feeling maybe shy or something. So, verbal codes here. Um, so again, most of what we look at in this lecture is 90% is about nonverbal communication, but we give just a little bit of definition of verbal codes. So when you compare them together, you actually see the main differences. Now, verbal codes. Now, language is, is basically the easiest way and how we send messages about different ideas to a lot of people. So for example, again, you're watching the news and you are trying to understand what's happening with the United States these days. So that is, that is a way of sending a verbal code. Um, language, again, allows us, again, like what we've been doing. Um, you guys are asking about your midterm or you are sharing your concerns about maybe the time limit, or what do I do if this happened, or so on. So you're sharing your concerns, maybe you're agreeing or disagreeing with me, remembering the history, remembering the past, or even talking about future details. We have three important features of a verbal language. Think about the ways that we learn language throughout the years. Uh, maybe even you want to connect them to uh, communication and self-development from two Fridays ago. So how do we first learn our mother tongue language? So I know that most of your mother tongues is either um, Punjabi or Hindu, I believe. So how do you learn the very first words of these language? Um, it's probably it comes learning the relationship between the language and the object. Most of the time, learning your very first, uh, learning your mother tongue language is very informal. So you learn it with your parents at home. Maybe they teach you again, the object like square or circles or colors. So that's a very in informal setting of learning. Um, mostly you grow up, you go to school, you start, you know, your pre, like your, your kindergarten and so on. And then your second language comes in, which is most of the time is English. So your learning second language becomes more formal with, again, a combination of both oral and non-oral approaches. So uh, again, this, it's, a, it's a big difference. Now you're learning one language at home very informally with your parents. And then the second you are in a classroom in a more formal setting. Then the other one that the third feature that we have about for verbal language is the system that rules and governs the composition of these symbols. Um, again, um, going back to communication uh, or semiotics actually, actually, um, when we look at things like um, 
how do I use specific words in specific situations? Um, who tells me to use what? Or who tells me to use which words where exactly? Um, again, it, all of these come by huge experience or by long experience, even if you're a child. But you know what kind of words do I use with this person or again, my parent, my friend, my boss, and so on. Oops. Um, we have five definitions of verbal language. Um, again, some of the, qu the questions that you might see here in your midterm is, uh, it, might be diff it might be, again, multiple choice. So I'll get you a word and I'll ask you which is the correct definition for all of them, or it could be, um, um, vice versa, I could give you, I could provide you with a whole sentence and tell you which word fits this better. So what happens is um, when you guys, for example, go to your break and you switch back to your own mother tongue, that's phonology. It's when you listen to someone who speaks a language other than your own, you hear some kind of different sounds, different music, and most of the time you, I cannot tell what this or that means. Morphology is small units of meaning in language. What does small units mean? It's anything like of, in, but, and, or. So all of these small units that connects sentences and makes meaning in a sentence is called a morphology. Um, semantics is again what we had in semiotics is the relationship between words and what they represent. Remember like again a tree, what does it represent to you? Um, or even semantics could even work with nonverbal language. They could mean something to you, could mean something completely different to me. So that's the relationship between a gesture or a word and what they represent to each and every different person. Uh, pragmatic is the effects of language of all verbal language. Again, the same, um, the way that you, the reason that you use specific language with your parents, another effect that you use a specific language with your friends or your boss and so on. Um, a funny example that I look at pragmatics, especially happening nowadays in the, you know, in the age of the smartphones. Um, you're talking with your friend, you're texting them through, through let's say WhatsApp or any of these instant messages uh, applications. And you're not using an emoji. So one of the things that your friend is going to tell you is, you know, are you okay? Are you upset? Uh, is, are you feeling okay? Why, why does it, is this the first instinct that gets us? Because again, we're, we're texting, we're not face to face. So we don't really know what is the effect of my language on that person. Did I say a joke that might have offended them or upset them? So using these emojis makes it feel better. Uh, and finally, syntactic is the relationships of words with one another. Basically, it's again, it's a very English-based um, element, like the ones that we had very first in the communication and culture. Uh, again, how do we put words, the order of the words in one sentence? How do they make sense? Um, what kind of ideas do they give? And so on. Now, nonverbal language, now that's the pretty much the essence of our class today. Uh, now, nonverbal codes encompass the way again. So, coming from high context culture, so I'm from high context culture and you guys are from high context culture. Most of the time, we don't only look at the words that are being said, but we look at everything else. We look at again the body language, we look at the gestures, like your face, your facial expressions, your hand movements, even your tone of your voice. Like when I start a class with you guys and I go like, uh, Nurhan, how are you doing? And I'm like, I'm fine, I'm fine. All right, so my verbal language is telling you she's fine, but my nonverbal language is, you look at other elements. You look, for example, that my voice tone is a little bit low. Um, my facial expressions are down. I'm not looking directly at you. So maybe all of these elements, when you look at it, it actually explains that, okay, your hand is not feeling very well. She's not very fine. So you look at how many times, let's say, um, um, I mean, I have had this uh, situation before, but let, I would like to know if you had this. 
you go out with a friend or a family member or someone and they're talking fine, but their body language maybe shows that they're uncomfortable or they're upset or they're anxious. And you go back home and you tell your your parents, you tell your mom or your dad, well, you know, I've, I've, I was out with my friend or my cousin and they were acting very weird. And then you start analyzing how they were sitting or how they were talking or how, you know, their facial expressions were. Has any of you been through something similar before? Let's, let's take a look, for example, at this guy. Um, now again, when you're talking to someone, let's say you're confronting someone of a mistake that he did. Now, lack of eye contact might indicate that a person maybe is not in favor He's not happy of what you're telling them, or he's not interested in this topic or situation, or again, simply that ugh, I'm, ugh, I'm not interested, or you're rolling your eyes, you're not looking directly at me. Um, across the arms, close a person. Now, crossed arms, this, this gesture of, you know, you're crossing your arms has had lots of definitions in, you know, in the past hundred years. Now, people say, um, again, the most common definitions when you're crossing your arm mean that you are very defensive and you're not very happy about what being said. But for example, if I do cross my arms, I might be, I'm, I'm actually paying more attention when I'm crossing my arms or I'm like really listening. So he says here, crossed arms close a person off to social influences. Maybe you are in a big gathering and you're uncomfortable, so you're crossing your arms, so you don't want to, you know, maybe touch anyone or to be close to anyone. And it can be a sign that an issue may have gone unresolved. So maybe you're in an argument with someone and you go like, okay, fine, 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 and you're crossing your arms because you're not happy about the final agreement. Feet tapping, you tap your feet when you're, when you're standing, it could be an indicating of, again, there's a lot of elements that could indicate, it could indicate you're, you're ready to leave. Again, you're feeling a little bit anxious about something, you don't wanna be here, so different elements to the same gesture. Again, depending on the situation and context and so on. Now, what are some of the characteristics of nonverbal codes? Now, of course, the biggest one here is that they are multi-channel. Most of the time, we use them, we use more than one channel at the same time. Um, now, again, coming from a high context culture, I could be using different things. I could be using my facial expressions, and I could be using my hands at the same time. So multi-channel means that there's, you're using more than one channel when sending a message. Right, so again, think about it. How many times you believe you have used more than one nonverbal channel when you're sending a message? It could be your voice tone and your hands. It could be your facial expressions and your voice tone and your hands. So you're using more than one. A nonverbal channel, a nonverbal language is multifunctional. Multifunctional means that I'm able to send different messages. Uh, they have more than one function. A function is, again, is a use, is a, is a method of using. Um, so again, um, you, I said I use nonverbal language to, in a way to send emotions, expressions, uh, maybe even secret messages. Again, you're in a place with a friend and you're having a good time and someone else that you guys do not like so much walks in. All right, so maybe you want to use your eyes like, look at that, the, you know, the friend that you don't like just walked in. Or maybe you want to give them a tap on the shoulder here that, you know, he's, look, pay attention, look at that. All right, so it has different functions and it has different uses. Um, Nonverbal language is, again, is spontaneously, it's, again, it's most of the time it's spontaneous. We don't really think about, I'm gonna raise my hand right now, or I'm going to use a specific voice tone. They're very spontaneous, they're very subconscious. We don't really think about them. Uh, they happen regularly when we're talking. And finally, there's no dictionaries or there's no formal set of rules that provide what these nonverbal language means in specific cultures. That's why 
again, that's why there might some misunderstanding or miscommunication might happen. Um, again, let's say you went to Egypt and you used this, but you didn't know what it meant in Egypt, right? You said you were telling this person in a restaurant, oh, your food is delicious. Your food is just great. And you don't know what it means in Egypt. So the, the receiver might think that you are threatening them. Like, why are you threatening me? That you didn't like my food, for example. So there's no dictionaries for these nonverbal language. They just happen, um, again, across the world and people get to know them by culture. Now, there are two things that we wanna understand in nonverbal language. Something that we call universality in nonverbal language means what is common and what is similar across the world and across the cultures. And the other one is variations. The variation means what is what differs or what seems different in things. Now, of course, we know that each culture have their own set. <clears throat> their own set of verbal language, um, but we want to talk about the elements themselves. So here in universality, again, universality is the same ideas and the same concepts would happen across cultures. Um, the same ideas that we have across cultures is that nonverbal channels are used to convey similar information. We convey them for emotions, especially your voice tone, some, when you're angry, you're shouting, right? Uh, so again, you're showing an emotion and that's pretty much similar across the world. Maybe your values, it's your self-disclosing messages, like when you tell your friend in a secret that you know someone else has joined the room. Almost the same body parts are used for nonverbal expressions. So across the world, our face is probably going to show emotions. Maybe my hand is used for explaining something more. Uh, the way that I'm standing, if I'm standing like swinging between one feet to the other, might um, send elements of um, me not being very comfortable. So the same body parts could be similar across the world, even if those same body parts are being used differently but you're using it for the same context. Nonverbal messages, most of the time, accompany verbal communication and are used in ritual and art. Now, again, especially in Bollywood movies, for example, there's a lot of dancing and music in these movies. The way that they dress, uh, the way that they use their hands, for example, nonverbal communication comes definitely in rituals and arts. Uh, the motives for using nonverbal channels are similar. The reasons we use them is the same across the world. To send, you know, to maybe signify the message makes it more important. And finally, nonverbal messages are used to coordinate and control a range of contexts. Again, it makes it easier to be able to send emotions or expressions or ideas that are similar across cultures. Now, what is variation? What is different across these cultures? <clears throat> across cultures. Um, cultures differ in specific, what we call <clears throat> repertoire of behaviors that are enacted. Uh, we mean here that certain movements, certain body positions, cer certain posture, like for example, um, in China and Japan, they usually bow to their elders, for example, and it's not very common in Egypt to bow for your elders. So certain movements, certain postures, certain body positions are very, very specific to a very specific culture. Uh, again, bowing to someone is not very common in other cultures. For, for example, here your culture differ in very specific behaviors in very specific uh, places. Um, so like, like again, like Japan having bowing to someone or their elder, India touching their feet, um, uh, Egypt, for example, um, kissing their forehead. So these are very specific situations, very specific behaviors in specific cultures. Okay. Like again, uh, maybe even the Irish dancing, uh, like tapping their feet and the Irish skirt, that's very specific to Ireland. Uh, same thing with the Indian dancing and so on. 
Um, the other point that we have, again, all cultures have display rules that govern when and under what summer circumstances could we use nonverbal expressions um, and when they are required, preferred, permitted, or prohibited. So, for example, um, as a child, you were misbehaving and your mom is, you know, she's giving you a look because you're misbehaving in front of strangers. So here, you know that your action is prohibited. I should not continue doing my action because my mom just gave me a look. Now, the display rules here differ in the way that you want to express it to people. Uh, for example, again, as a child, you want to play with some friends and um, you're not sure if your mom is going to be okay. So you're going to look at her and she's going to maybe give you a smile back. That means that your action is permitted. She's giving you permission to go around and play. Um, these display rules differ again in a way that you express different things to people. For example, how you stand talking to people. Um, who, who can you touch? Who's comfortable in you giving them a touch? Um, where? like um, on the shoulder. Again, sometimes people like laughing and joking around with like giving them a small slap on the face, not, not a hard slap, but like, you know, like this. Talking loudly with gestures or with absolutely no body movement. So these are all could tell you. Again, let's say you're, uh, someone is overly touchy with you and you're very uncomfortable. So this person is, is Keep, keeps you know tapping your shoulder but you don't like this so maybe you're going to put your body a little bit away so again you're telling them that this action is prohibited you're not happy with this action and finally the meanings or interpretations that are attributed to a particular nonverbal behavior again remember the sign excellent this is an interpretation of excellent or good or delicious um, other places could have it as um, zero. She gave me a zero in the exam. Or again, like in Egypt, I will break your face once we go home. Um, so different interpretations for these nonverbal behavior could be extremely wide in other places. So again, like this sign. So it used to be, again, years ago, the sign of victory or sign of peace or number two. I, I want to understand the second question, please. All right. So, again, it has different meanings in different contexts and in different situations. So, we have those three interpretations. Non verbal behavior means. Okay. We have random. That's a really big arrow. We have shared and we have idiosyncratic. Shared. Um, idio, it's a pretty annoying word, syncratic. Okay, what do those guys mean? Oops. Now, something that is random, it basically means there's no a close definition or there's no particular definition that is associated with this behavior to anyone. So again, when I give you a look, this could absolutely mean anything and someone else could understand it something else. So a random nonverbal behavior has no particular relation to anyone. Anyone could basically understand it the way they are. Nothing uh, nothing too focused or nothing too associated with anything. An idiosyntractic. Okay. An idiosyntractic here is suggest that behaviors are unique to spe specific individuals or relationships. Basically, it has a closed meaning to a particular uh, people. Those people could be. Um, 
um, like uh, like a job. It could be like a family, friends. So in a group of friends, let's say um, we're like five to six people. We're a very close group of friends, and um, the, um, someone is not feeling very well. Someone is qu we we know this person is always very talkative. They're funny. They're you know they're always making jokes, but then suddenly this friend comes, you know, he goes to your place to hang out, but they're not talking. They're very, they look sad. They're not upset. So the first thing that you and your friends are going to, you know, to, you know, to work with is that, um, why is he upset? So this behavior is different and it's unique and it suggests something to specific individuals or relationships. So, I just in track basically suggest that I'm gonna make it a little bit big. That behaviors are unique to specific individuals or a specific individual organ relate different relationships like such as family, such as friends. Um, that carry a closed meaning. Again, the example that we have, family recognizes that um, someone is quiet means they are sad. All right, so again, a family member recognizes that this specific behavior signifies or it tells about a specific emotional state. Again, this person is always happy, he's always talking, but now they're very quiet. So what does that mean? Now, a shared meaning, a shared meaning here signifies that a huge group of people, now this, this is shared across the culture. When a huge group of people have a significance, when a group of people attribute the same meaning to a particular act. Meaning signifies when a group of people oops, attribute the same meaning to a to a particular act. Example group of divers using the okay sign, which is this one. So we use this, it is, this is a shared meaning across the world that this is okay, this is good, right? But the divers have their own shared meaning that this, when they do like that in the, in the sea, that they're gonna go up. They're gonna go up to the surface. So again, in three interpretations. Now, Idus and Tractic is usually in a very small circle. Shared meaning could have a bigger thing. Like again, divers across the world understand this. There's a shared meaning across the culture. So this is shared in Egypt that this is a threatening sign, but to you guys, so you guys were not from Egypt, this is a random sign. I don't, you know, I don't get it. Does not mean anything. So why is this three, they're very important, and again, a lot of students get confused with it. Because what is considered shared in my culture could be random to you, because you're not in my culture. You don't, we don't share the same culture. What is shared in India, what is common, in India, again, such as, you know, touching the feet uh, of the elders, to me, it's a random gesture. It doesn't have a particular relation. I don't get it, okay? 
uh, and I do interact again when a small number of people understand a specific behavior. Again, uh, when a family understand that someone is, is sad or maybe they have got some good, some bad news on the phone. So a small number of people, it's very close. Again, uh, could be like a small family member, could be even a small community. For example, like the Indian community in Vancouver. So you might have the IDUS Interactic between you guys, something that is closed. Um, the other thing that you want to know, again, it, it gets a little bit more complicated, but keep an open mind to it. Each culture or each country could even have their own random IDUS Interactic and shared good. They could have it even in in the same country. Uh, so for example, um, American professor, he's teaching in the United States, okay? Um, they're, they have, they're, they're very low context. They don't really look at different elements and different, uh, different um, uh, nonverbal behavior. So let's say he was giving a lecture, he was giving a very long lecture, and then he decided to have a break in the classroom. He rested on the, on the chair, and then he put his feet up on the desk. So in the American culture, it's a very like it's a very random behavior. I'm just resting. I'm just resting my feet because I was standing for the past two hours. <clears throat> but if that American professor was teaching in Egypt, it's a shared meaning in Egypt that it's a <clears throat> sorry, it's an insult to show the soles of your feet to someone's face. So to him, it was a random act, but to the Egyptian people or to the Egyptian student, it's a shared meaning that it's an, it's an offensive gesture to show, to show the back of your feet to someone else. So these differences, of course, of course could cause a lot of problems in the nonverbal cultural communication. Um, something, again, something that is random. Let's say we're having an embarrassing conversation because you did not do well in your midterm. So we're having a very tough conversation together. Um, I could be smiling as the sender to show you friendliness and to show you that, you know what, everything is gonna be okay, don't worry about it. The other person, the receiver could be smiling to hide their embarrassment because they're, embarrassing, they're embarrassed of their bad grades, for example, all right? So these are some examples of what could be random to me, could be shared to you, and vice versa, of course. Go back to our slide. So how, what kind of functions do we have? Remember when we said a few page, uh, slides earlier that nonverbal language is multifunctional. Okay, what kind of functions do we have? So again, functions here, they mean that the purpose or the use or the motive that I use nonverbal communication for. Um, nonverbal communication, again, is best understood as what we call it, coordinated system. You coordinate it, of course, with your, the words or even your silence that facilitates and, of course, your own inter interpersonal goals. Uh, like again, the idea of how we accompany our nonverbal language to give extra meaning. Um, I could, I could let, let's imagine I'm explaining and I am very solid nonverb and I'm using a very solid tone. I'm not even using my facial expressions. So let's pretend that this is the way that I'm explaining. Nonverbal functions in intercultural communication. Functions are the purpose, meanings, motives, reasons, and goals of communications. They provide information. They manage impression. Now, explaining. Now, imagine again explaining in a complete solid motion. Um, it's going to actually give very less meaning than explaining using nonverbal language. Another example that we always use nonverbal language to give extra meaning is someone is calling you on the phone to explain or to, um, they want to know some directions for the road, okay? Now they're on the phone. Now again, they cannot see you, right? But you're on the phone and you're like, okay, go straight ahead. You'll find a roundabout, go the first left of the roundabout. Why are you using your nonverbal language when the, when the receiver cannot see you.
So there, again, there's hundreds of functions of intercultural of nonverbal language, but we're going to um, discuss the most common, which is five of them. So we have the providing information, we manage impressions, expressing emotions, of course, interactions, and conveying a relationship. Now, providing information. Now, verbal codes are uh, ver very useful, of course, to convey logical and factual information, such as explaining such as math, science, um, again, something that is factual. But nonverbal codes are most useful to convey global meanings and emotional information. Uh, again, you, you, let's say one of your parents is talking to you about a big problem in the family. So that's an emotional information. So I might be using a lot of hand gestures like, did you see what happened with your sister? We need to figure out something that we can fix it together. So these are all different um, informations. Of course, you provide information with your faces. You provide information if you're bored, if you are happy, if you're excited. And that is actually one of the things that me as Nurhan do not like having online classes because I cannot see what kind of information that you guys provide me with. Uh, again, your faces, your instant feedback is very important in the teaching process. So, um, when I teach in a classroom, I could see my student if they are interested in the context, if they are bored, if they have something on their mind, uh, if they're not paying attention. So these are all information that is valuable to me that I then could tell, okay, if I can see that they are bored, I can try to change something a little bit, which is I do not have right now because, um, we're offline, you guys are using, not using the cameras. Uh, so this information is missing. So actually a huge part of our communication is missing because there is no instant feedback. In managing impressions, do you guys remember in communication self-development, um, I see you seeing me, seeing you back. I mentioned here is there's a lot of elements that are very interconnected together. So um, some questions that you might appear in the exam might have relation between chapter three and chapter six together, and it's connected. So keep an open mind that there's a lot of things that interlap together. Okay. So in managing an impression, basically what you wear where you move, even how you stand, the way that you look at me, all of this send messages. Again, imagine um, uh, you're going on a date and the person you're going to meet is wearing horribly. They're not putting any attention to the way they dress, the way that they are sitting, the way that they even look at you and talk to you. What kind of messages are they sending to you? You're talking to me about an important subject and I'm just, you know, I'm rolling my eyes at you. I'm like, hmm, hmm, yeah, whatever. Okay. Again, my face is kind of telling you, I don't care about the topic you're, you're talking about. So again, this is an impression that I'm giving you. Again, it's very, very related to the concept of I see you seeing me because I, I, want, I want to see what I am sending you and what you are sending me back. So again, same thing. If, I, if there's an interview and I come in late, again, with very ragged clothes, and I keep like in an interview, I keep looking at the watch every two minutes. What does that tell the interviewee that, you know, you're not, you're not, you, you want to be somewhere else, for example. So basically, this is the perception or image I want you to have, okay? And this is how I view you. Expressing emotions, of course, that is the basic function of nonverbal communication. That's the primary way of showing emotions are nonverbal. Again, a smile of happiness, um, showing anger, surprise, fear, even jealousy. You know, you're jealous of someone, you know, having a really good grades or having a really nice car. Um, even the the voice of your tone could convey your personal state. Like again, like when I said this earlier, I told you I'm fine. 
I'm being very angry in my voice tone. So again, my verbal message is telling you that I'm fine, but my nonverbal message is telling you that I'm angry or upset. So again, your facial expressions that convey feelings often are very spontaneously. Most of the time, we do not have control over our face. If you're bored, it's going to show that you're bored. If you're happy, it's going to show that you're happy. Uh, and of course, the tone of voice. And then we have another one, the regulating interactions. Now, conversations are highly structured. Again, this is very useful when we are in, a, in an actual physical classroom. Now, we do it every day. Uh, again, especially in the classroom. Uh, let's say um, a student raised their hand. So I can see that they have something to add. But um, let's say I'm still lecturing. So sometimes when I'm still lecturing, I go like, you know, give me, give me a second so I can, uh, and I'll be back to you. Um, sometimes even again, when you're, I could tell, uh, you know, as the instructor that someone is confused. So this is a regulated interaction. I could stop and I can ask, do you have a question or are you focused? What's going on? Um, again, and when I'm still, for example, talking, I'll be like, please, no interruption right now. So looking behavior or vocal inflections or gestures, and again, general, very general cues of readiness to help or signal a personal conversation's intentions. Um, one of the best examples of regulating interaction is a, 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 a police uh, traffic, um, what's it called, like a traffic police, traffic police, I think. They have the stop, the stop sign, and they have the please continue, move on, and they have their whistle so they can stop people if uh, they're still moving or they stop the cars. So that's an interaction. You're regulating back and forth elements. So like you just said, with people taking turns into talking back and forth in a more structured manner. Now again, imagine that all 40 people uh, in the classroom started to talk at the same time. So one of us has to go like, okay, please you stop and you go ahead like again like a traffic light so talking again in a structured manners nonverbal codes help maintaining going back and forth together and the i think that's the final function that we have yeah is conveying relationship Interpersonal communication. Uh, now, in conveying relationship, now interpersonal relationship, whatever kind of relationship that we have, they could develop and sustain through, of course, nonverbal communication. Now, every time that we talk, I'm always like this. I'm always crossing my arms. So maybe it's the way that I'm showing you that you know I I don't trust you very much, or I'm putting some boundaries in our relationship. It could even show equality and inequality. Again, I'm sitting at the desk um, and maybe I'm looking, yeah, just go on and keep talking. So it could, it could even show different signs of authorities, like who is above the other. Of course, love and hate, trust and distrust. Um, when you're standing higher above someone, this is a very interesting one. Um, let's say you come unannounced at my door. So I don't know if I can try to act the scene. Um, you will come unannounced at my door and I have my door closed. And I'm not inviting you in. So I am just have the door closed and I'm like, yes, do you need something? What's up? Versus actually opening the door very well and be like, hi, come on in. It's so good to see you. Come inside. Um, so this could tell you actually if someone is being welcoming or someone is, again, putting boundaries in your own relationships. Maybe even speaking loudly. You're too excited about something and you want to share this with your friend or speaking very quietly or softly or even not talking at all because you don't want like the person. Uh, for example, it happened to me a few times where we would be going out with a group of friends and I have something to share with them, but there's one particular person that I do not like. So I actually might not speak at all because of this one person. So I'm kind of telling the relationship, um, mm, I don't trust you very much to share this um, information with you. Now, those we've been discussing, you know, the five functions of nonverbal communication.
But what about the messages that we want to send? What kind of messages do we send in nonverbal communication? So oh, again, there is so many messages, but we're going to talk about the most, uh, the main common ones. Physical attributes, of course. Physical attributes has a lot of things. Now, your physical appearance. Now, first, in a physical appearance, this is the first thing that you're going to see about someone in a job interview, in a class like me and you guys. Um, again, some things are permanent. Some things really don't change, like, again, your body shape, um, your facial features, you know, your skin color, uh, your weight, your height. These are pretty permanent, pretty uh, the same thing. Um, all of others, so you, you, you see those first things. Then you have other modifications. You have the way that they dress, their style, right? Maybe they have tattoos, they have piercings. They have a dyed, funky green hair, for example. And then, of course, other meanings, other shared meaning. Maybe they wear glasses. Um, the way that they style their hair, the jewelry that they wear. So all of these are things that we, again, very similar to managing the impressions. First thing that you see is about a person. How do they look like? What are, what are, um, what, what are they wearing? And so on. What kind of impression do they want to share with you according to their physical so appearance? So let's take a look at these guys. For example, she has a very weird look on her face. She's very maybe suspicious of you. She's giving you, mm-hmm, go ahead. Does she trust you? Does she not trust you? Um, the way that she has her legs, the way that she's standing. Of course, there are so many other ways that you can try to analyze the way that they're standing and the way that they're talking. Um, their eyeglasses. Uh, for example, there's a lot of people who wear sunglasses indoors and you feel like, why are they wearing sunglasses indoors? Um, again, are they maybe famous? Like, you know, famous celebrities? Um, they don't want to talk to the person in front of them with their eyes open. Um, their legs, they maybe want to leave and they're in between. This guy, look at his face and his shoulders. Does he have a hostile attitude? Is he being aggressive? Um, the way that he's standing, maybe the way that he's dressed. Um, this smiley person, you know, she's smiling at you. She's very interested. Uh, but why is her hands on her hips? Is it maybe a way of stretching? Is she being defensive? What's going on? Um, this guy, maybe he's, again, he's making fun of you, the way that he's looking at you. Um, his hands in his pocket, what are all of these elements mean? So there's, a, again, physical appearance come into different things. Physical appearance comes into the way that you dress, the way that you walk, the way that you talk, your, your actual appearance, again, your, like your body shape and your skin type, and your other modifications. So what does these again, ideas tell us. Now, of course, other things about physical appearance is that they could actually tell us about cultural identity. Now, take a look at this. This is physical appearance. It talks about your cultural identity, your preference, your mood, maybe even your status. So I know that the picture on the left here is a common traditional um, Indian gown, for example. So the way that you dress tells about, again, your cultural identity and your own personal identity. Um, the one on the side here is a very traditional uh, Egyptian farmer um, dress. So most of Egyptian farmers uh, or ladies of Egyptian farmers wear very colorful clothes, for example. So again, something about your own cultural identity and so on. Now, there's a lot of thing in, in what the environment um, could tell you, like the surroundings. It, again, it sends you a lot of messages about the person. Um, for example, um, here we have some locations. The very first um, raw over here, we have the locations. Um, the home. You go to someone's house, and again, it, it tells you about them. For example, they don't have a lot of furniture or they ha don't have a lot of decor, so they could be a minimalist, for example, or they could have lots of paintings around them, so they could be like an artistic or visualistic person, or 
they could have lots of plants and greenery. So it tells you that he's nature friendly, for example. Even in a classroom, the way that you sit, you want to sit in the front. You maybe you want to tell that you are, um, you know, you're very committed to the class or you're going to sit in the back because you're a little bit shy. So you want to sit in the back row. Any outdoor location, again, beach and so on. Now, we also look at what is inside that location, right? Like the objects, the tools, the, for how the furniture is being assigned, the lightning, of course, decorations, and so on. Now, what we really want to focus on in the environment, especially here, is the last row. This is the important row over here. So environment differs here in five elements, warmth, uh, familiarity, privacy, constraint, and the distance. Um, for example, um, United States students studying in Costa Rica uh, could be considered rude because maybe the, these United States students, or American students are too casual with their teacher. Um, and then Costa Rican students will feel like, why are you too casual? So that's a way in which we look at the environment. Now let's start with the very first one, warmth. So when I say warmth here, I'm not talking about actual temperature, but rather I'm, I'm talking about, does this person makes you warm and comfortable and welcoming, um, uh, invitable to their presence? Let's say you go to someone's house and you smell very nice food. And it's you, how many times you go to someone's house and you feel like, oh, this, this house is cozy. This house is comfortable. That is, that is pretty much it. It's, it's, you feel this person is, is giving you warmth and welcoming you in. So it's not about the temperature. It's about how warm do you feel this person is, how welcoming they are. In familiarity, uh, let me see. Okay, to a degree in which the environment is well known, it's predictable. The more a predictable a place is, the more familiar you are to it, uh, the, the more comfortable you get. <clears throat> So when we used to have physical classrooms, um, like, you know, again, you go to your actual, you know, you go into the room, you don't know where you're sitting, it's the first day of classes, and um, your the environment here is new, such as going to a new job, the environment is still new, you're not very familiar with the people, you're not familiar with the place, you're not familiar with the surrounding, but time by time, when you start going and you start, you know, adapting to it, okay, you're, you're more familiar now, you're more comfortable with the place. So the more familiar you get to the place, the more comfortable and the predictable you are. So again, you go to a classroom, you know exactly where you're going to sit because you know the place. You're still not looking for familiar places or familiar faces. In a privacy, here in privacy, we're talking about the degree in which it allows you to be either surrounded or isolated. Um, just a little tip, uh, these five elements are written in well detailed in your readings. So please make sure that you, you do your readings very um, deeply because they're very well written in your, in your readings. So um, I'm talking here about again in how private I am in this place. So in an, um, in an outdoor location, there are some behaviors, some nonverbal behaviors that I might not do, that I might not engage with because the level of privacy in an outdoor location is very low. I don't expect any privacy. However, in my house, I could do whatever I want, you know, because it's, it's private. My level of privacy and my level of expectations and privacy inside my house is pretty high. So it is the degree in which it allows you to be surrounded or isolated. Um, on the other hand, not only your expectations of privacy, but also uh, a friend invites you to their house and um, you tell them, can I have a cup of coffee or a cup of water? And they tell you, yeah, sure, come on in. 
you know, your it's your it's you know, my house is your house. Please come to the kitchen, help yourself. So, what kind of level of privacy is is this? Is the house owner sharing with you versus someone else? You ask them for a cup of coffee and be like, okay, please wait here. Don't move. I will get you your cup of coffee. So again, this person does not want to share more privacy or more intimacy with you. So again, this behavior actually shows you and sends you a message about the person. Are they welcoming to you? Are they friendly to you? Or they do they want to keep some boundaries? Um, the last one is constraint. Now, constraint where you feel you are stuck in an environment. And it has two levels, some kind of physical and psychological. Let me grab the whiteboard over here. Hold a second, I just might need to put the charger really quickly. Just give me a second, everyone. Here we go, okay. <clears throat> so in a, con in a constraint level, you have two things. You have, again, you have a um, physical constraint and psychological constraint. Physical and <clears throat> psychological. Now, when you're constrained in an actual physical location means that you are constrained means that you are unable to move that someone is constraining you so you have you're again you're unable to move so on ability to move it could be for example in an airplane you're traveling back to your home country it's going to be in like a 10 hour flight the level of constraint in an airplane is very high Sometimes it makes people uncomfortable because they feel like, okay, I'm not going to be able to move for 10 hours. Um, how can I be less anxious about this? I'm going to be surrounded. Again, your privacy in, uh, in an airplane is very low. You're going to be surrounded with people that you do not know. A psychological constraint is, again, some kind of a stereotype or a taboo that your culture put around it. Uh, so, put around you, stereotype, or a, um, again, for example, um, in some cultures, I think uh, it might be similar in India and in Egypt, that, for example, having a girlfriend or a boyfriend is a taboo. So if you do have a girlfriend or a boyfriend, you feel like you're psychologically constrained. Maybe you feel like I don't want anyone to see me. I don't want my family members to see me because if they saw and they found out that I have a girlfriend or a boyfriend, it's, it's constraining. Uh, let's say again, you are in a, remember the fluid situations that we had in communication self-development? Uh, let's say you're in a fluid situation and then you found yourself in a party. You don't want to be in that party, but you, start, you found yourself with your friends too big of a party and there's so many people. So you feel like, again, you're psychologically constrained. You're going to be hands crossed. You're going to be sit, standing in the corner of the room and you're psychologically constrained because you're unable to move because you are here with your friends. So constraining here comes again in, in different, again, in different shapes where you will feel I physically cannot move from a place because again, let's say you're in a classroom, maybe your level of constraint in a classroom is medium. You're not supposed to come and go in a classroom as you please, but at the same time, <clears throat> the, the teacher is not keeping you forcibly inside of the classroom. Um, and finally, the last one that we have is distance. Um, now again, distance here is a, do I have it here? Now distance here is, um, and I'll show you a video about distance in a little bit. Um, how close or how, uh, remember when I said earlier, for example, um, American people, Canadian people do not like to stand very close to each other. You have to keep an arm's length. So the other person should be at the tip of your fingers while talking. Rather than people from our culture, high context culture, they don't mind keeping distance close. 
We've spoken about it in the um, intercultural communication last week, where, for example, it says, uh, uh, in the, especially in the um, high context culture, is that space and distance is contemporalized. Everyone is in everyone's space. Again, it could be both uh, distance, like an actual distance, or your space, like, what are you doing? Like invading your personal privacy. Or in a low context culture, we talk, it's about the territoriality. So go back and, and read it. So distance here is very similar to the territoriality in both low context culture and high context culture. Movements, now body movement is the most researched topic in nonverbal communication. Uh, body movements, again, uh, you could send a lot of messages with your gestures, with your head movements. So for example, when I very first, when the very first time I taught Indian students here in Canada, um, when I tell them, how are you guys doing or are you doing okay? And then the students would do like this. I wasn't sure this to you guys was, I think it's a more of a, a shared nonverbal behavior. So it's shared in India that this means like, you know, you're good, you're, you're, we're on the same path, we're going okay. But to me, it was a random act. I wasn't sure was this a yes or a no. And it took me, it was a lot of misconfusion or misunderstanding to actually know what was going on. Of course, facial expressions is in the body movement, even eye behavior. Again, you're talking to me and I'm rolling my eyes or I'm not looking at you, right? The thing is about body movement is that we want to really focus on is that no single type of behavior exists in isolation. It means that they never come alone. Most of the time your gesture could come with a uh, head movements, your, the way that you're standing could come with your facial expression. So they never come alone. They never come in, a, in an isolation. Personal space, very similar to what we talked about the distance. Um, there is a myth again it might be right it might be wrong but there is a myth that says when a colder a climate is the colder the weather is in some countries the larger physical distance they require such as again in places in Europe or in the United States and Canada and the warmer the climate is the more closer we tend to stand to each other is this right is this wrong maybe Right, so cultures here are organized in some, again, the spatial pattern. The pattern can reveal a lot of characteristics in that culture. Now, again, personal space distances are, are very cultural specific. Now, let me show you a quick video about the personal space thing going. Okay, what we have next is touch, the sense of touch. Now, basically, it's, again, it's it's the effect of, again, how I, I, I feel about someone. So it's a very basic um, component of human communication. Again, we do that, our mothers, for example, do that since we were babies, for example. They touch us for um, comfortness and so on. It experiences, again, long before we were able to see and speak. Um, and again, it's a very fundamental and an important part in the human experience. And it has, of course, uh, different elements. So, uh, such as effect. Effect is, again, how I feel about someone. I want to show them I, if I, again, I like them, so I give them a hug, for example. It can express negative or positive emotions, such as pushing someone really from you, like I don't come near to me. Uh, tapping someone's shoulder to bring their attention, like, hey, excuse me pay attention to me. Um, it could even be mean, uh, it could have like means of control, like to push you more or even pull you, like stay here, I'm pulling you. So it could even be controlling you. Um, shaking hands is a part of touch. Like for example, I'm shaking your hand, but I'm squeezing really hard. So I'm, I'm giving you a message that I'm stronger or more authority than you. Um, clasping the shoulders, if you're having fun with someone, of course, kissing, slapping, hitting, all of these. So it shows a lot of emotion, again, reassurance, support, hatred, and dislike. There's another video about the touch. I'll show it to you in just a second. Um, the other one that we have is voice. Now, voice helps in accenting or underscoring the verbal messages. So sometimes I go like, 
listen. Listen, I'm, I'm putting very much attention on the word listen. Again, this is a verbal language, but I'm using her here, the attention or really uh, stressing the word. So you can actually pay attention. Other ways of sending, of, of using your voice tone is again, high tone when you're very excited, like you could be even screaming because you're happy about something or low tone when you're sad, like, I got some bad news, guys. So you're sad. You're not going to tell them, guys, I got terrible news that I'd like to share with you. That's going to be very weird. Um, so again, you emphasize some words using your voice tone. Even when you're um, fast speaking. Um, for example, when I was um, doing my master defense and my master thesis, I was very scared. I was very stressed. And then I found myself speaking too fast because I was stressed of the situation. You could even be talking in a smooth voice, so talking to your child or your parents, for example. Um, there are other things that we sometimes use when we, like when you're thinking. Um, I think that blah, 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 blah. Um, when you're discussing like, oh, for example, like these words down there. Um, something that was interesting when I first moved to Canada and I found it, um, I didn't find it anywhere else, when they say A. So for example, my boss would tell me the weather is nice today, A. And again, for the first few times when they said A, I didn't get exactly what that meant. But then I realized, okay, A means, you know, like, don't you think so, for example. What do you guys think? So again, another question for you guys that I'd like to hear some of your own um, like situations or examples. Do you think our own voice indicates our emotions? Yes, no, and how do you think so? Like again, tense, relaxed, calm, bored, excited. Does voice indicate our emotions? What do you guys think? So time orientation. Again, do you guys remember when we talked about time and intercultural communication in the low context and high context culture, uh, as well as in um, weak uncertainty avoidance and strong uncertainty avoidance? These are all elements of how to use our time. Um, of course, again, these are just element and like questions to make you um, try to critically understand how we use time in different places. So I could ask you in the midterm again, in what ways do we use time? So you have to explain again, including different elements. So first of all, how do people use their time? Um, again, is it something that is very, very structured and time is money? for example, or is it something that, you know, it's okay if I didn't do it tomorrow, if I didn't do it today, I'll do it tomorrow. How do we structure it? Again, is it something that I, I wake up with a plan? So for example, I have class from eight to 12, and then from 12 to two, I will have some office hours, and then from two to four, I'm gonna have my lunch. Is it something the structure or something like, it just comes when it comes. Time orientation is also to under, help us in understanding what we call a passage, which we'll get to understand when we look at oral cultures and writing cultures in the next few classes. Um, how again, how we understand the passing of time. Um, for example, do we take notes? Uh, do, is it something, something that I read from the past, from books, for example? How did people in the past use their time when they didn't have watches or clocks, for example? And finally, how does time affect our relationships? Um, people think, for example, when they're close to each other, they don't have to really figure, like think about the time. So let's say if I'm really close to someone um, and we said we're gonna meet by two, but it's okay, no, he's my friend, he's gonna wait. So I can go at three or four or whatever. Or because this is my friend and I have to respect them, I have to go on time. So again, how do you use time in your own context, in your own culture? Again, do you use it in a way that, okay, I have to respect my time, time is money, or do you take it as a way, you know what, I'm gonna take each day as it goes. And again, all of these are elements of, again, not, why is it nonverbal behavior? Again, let's say you're meeting a close friend of yours at two o'clock, uh, but then this friend was late. 
And then you said, it's okay, I was just late for 20 minutes, it's fine. But then you got very upset. You feel like, okay, is, is he not respecting me enough? Uh, are we not good friends? But maybe sometimes this friend, if he has a job interview, he will be there exactly on time. How does this affect your, the relationship with this friend? How does this maybe even t tell, like, say something about him for his job or have just an interview and so on?